This is a journey into a world of mystery and deceit, a fantastical place full of UFOs, strange encounters, and stories of alien abduction. My name is Nick Cook. I work for Jane's Information Group, which has reported on defense issues since 1898. I investigate secret military programs worth billions of dollars, but hidden from public view. I dig out evidence of classified technologies developed by the defense industry and concealed behind a network of false trails. It's my job to find out what really has been flying through our airspace. So from time to time, I examine sighting evidence of unidentified flying objects. Do these sightings offer evidence of top secret military and defense technology? Or do they hold clues to something more mysterious? This world is normally off limits for a journalist. But I want to discover for myself what is real and what is not. of April 1964, America experienced its first credible close encounter of the third kind. Officer Lonnie Zamora was driving along a quiet stretch of road skirting the edge of the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. What the hell was that? Suddenly he caught a glimpse of something strange in the sky. set off for the desert following the craft. He caught sight of a shiny object, now landed, about 200 yards away. As he looked over, he saw two figures in white coveralls, close to what looked like a flying saucer. Without warning, the craft took off and headed straight for him. And as quickly as it had arrived, it disappeared off into the distance at high speed. This statement by Lonnie Zamora is one of the most intriguing UFO reports on record. It made headline news at the time. Everyone acknowledged that Zamora was a first-class witness, a police officer, a man not prone to exaggeration. The Zamora case remains one of a handful of unexplained sightings in Project Blue Book. When investigators arrived at the scene, they found an impression in the soil surrounded by burnt brushwood. Zamora was so distraught that he insisted on seeing a priest before handing in his report. The US Air Force was under pressure to explain what had actually landed. But there is one man who claims he knows what Lonnie Zamora saw. Duke Gildenberg ran Cold War spy programs out of White Sands missile range and had access to top secret flight logs at the time. That very same day, we had a mission scheduled for the surveyor unmanned spacecraft uh, that was going to be attached to a small helicopter and then flown all around the range uh, by contractors sampling lava and that kind of thing, which they might see on the moon. On board was the pilot, and then there was an engineer, and they were both in white coveralls. So to us, that, you know, that identified it almost perfectly. It's too much of a coincidence. Two guys in white 
coveralls. They were doing the mission anyway. And then the sampler, which left a, a print in the dirt that was identical to what it later left in the moon. I'm not at all convinced by Gildenberg's explanation. Zamora was a trained police officer and I'm sure would have known the difference between a helicopter and a flying saucer. To try and make sense of what Zamora saw, we need to go back to the U-2 spy plane and to an event that shook the world on May the 1st, 1960. When U-2 pilot Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union, Cold War tensions intensified. The wreckage of his spy plane was put on public display in Moscow. This was a huge propaganda coup for Khrushchev, and it signaled the end of the U-2's covert life. It was understood very early in the U-2 program that it wouldn't be able to fly safely over the most denied areas of the Soviet Union forever. Uh, best, it was given a few years. Um, in fact, it flew operationally for just about four years, which was longer than anybody expected, before one of the aircraft was shot down. The CIA uh, launched an effort to produce a more workable aircraft with similar or better performance, and one that would be so fast and so high-flying that even the best missile technology that anybody could be looking at in those days would have a very hard time hitting it. Richard Bissell was head of the CIA's overflight program between 1956 and 1960, set up to monitor the USSR at the height of the Cold War. He was the man who was given the job of replacing the U-2, and he had a radical idea about how to do it. We see here that he's urging his technical department to design a new aircraft for reconnaissance missions over Russia. According to Bissell, who had a very good grasp of the technological challenges, the optimal shape for that vehicle would be saucer-shaped. The Avro car, which appears for all the world to be a flying disc. It wasn't just Bissell who had flying saucers on his mind. Just across the border, Avro, a Canadian-based company, had recruited talented British aerospace designer John Frost to work on a flying saucer. Frost was a visionary, and under his leadership, the company began experimenting with disc-shaped craft. Called the Avro car, it was a handful to fly and could barely get off the ground, but it caught the eye of the United States.